Good evening. On behalf of Eco Canada, welcome back to all of you to this year's edition of our Tutia Tavola online cooking experiences. It's nice to be back and I hope you enjoyed Buonissimo on May 18th when we had an online competition among six authentic Italian table restaurants of Toronto and the GTA prepare amazing dishes for us. Don't forget to call the restaurants or order online the featured dishes. They are an authentic Italian experience you cannot miss and they are available until June 20th. This year, Tutia Tavola is part of the True Italian Taste Project, an initiative promoted and financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, carried out by Asso Camere Estero in collaboration with the Italian Chambers of Commerce abroad to strengthen and protect the authentic Italian products. The recipes that Chef Roberto Fracchioni will present to us this evening, Panino di Montagna and Insalata Seria, will focus on specific certified ingredients such as spec from Alto Adige IGP and Montasio cheese DOP. He will show you how to use them in order to get the best experience out of them. You will be able to savor the taste and feel the fresh air of the high peaks of Trentino Alto Adige and Friuli. So welcome back to Chef Roberto, who hails from two of the finest food producing regions in the world the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy and the Niagara region of Canada. After having worked as executive chef for over 20 years, Roberto now lends his skills as a mentor and business advisor to cooks and restaurateurs throughout Ontario, while teaching various culinary programs in Toronto. Chef Racchioni has been working with Eco Canada on the True Italian Taste Project since 2017, and he is the Canadian brand ambassador for Prosciutto di Parma. Tonight and next week, in conversation with Chef Roberto, we have Jenny Arena, a food writer who delves into the history and origins of food. Jenny has been journaling stories and recipes in her food blog, Food Fables and Focaccia for over a decade, with a special focus on the traditions of Italian cuisine. Her passion for the culinary arts expands into hosting curated pop-up dinners and cooking classes, for which she has been featured on local media. We have prepared a great program for you, which will keep you company for the whole month of June and July, which will also include an exciting Father's Day special on June 15th. So now it's your turn to create your very own authentic Italian experience with the help of Roberto and Jenny. Before we start, I would like to remind you to take advantage of our special entry-level 12-month membership at $200, which is still in place for this year and support our chamber. And last but not at all least, a special thank you to Jen K. Overwill, tonight's sponsor, for its continued support over the years and for making some outstanding ingredients available to us this evening. Jenke Overwill brings the best food into Canada for us from all over the world, including meats, cheeses and groceries from Italy, and you can find them in all major grocery stores. Tonight's panino and salad is going to be buonissimo. Enjoy and over to you, Jenny and Roberto. Good evening, Jenny, and hello, Roberto. Welcome back. Buonasera. It's so delighted to be here. So thank you so much. I guess you're ready to start the evening, so I leave it over to you, and uh, I hope you will enjoy it too. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and I'm so happy to be here in conversation with Chef Roberto this evening. Uh, he is going to be cooking up some mouth-watering uh, items evening and uh, it's amazing that this is a really nice start to Italian Heritage Month as well. I can't think of a better way than to start with your series of cooking classes. Oh, I, I, I agree. Uh, it's a great way to get into it. You start uh, thinking about those old classic recipes that you know your nonna used to make or your mom used to make or dad and that's what I like doing about these classes. Trying to you know get those memories out again. I, I get it all the time when people say oh man I haven't had 
you know, uh, risotto since with blue cheese in it since my nono made it. I love all these classes. It just not only introduces products, but introduces memories and feelings and emotions to, to, to the viewers. I love it. I think it's awesome. Amazing. And as Tiziana mentioned, uh, the products you're going to be using this evening are DOP and IGP products. Do you want to just share a little bit with everybody what that means? Sure. So uh, DOP and IGP, it's, it's very confusing to a lot of people, but it's really quite simple. DOP and IGP are both seals of quality that are a European uh, designation. And this is very important. It's not just a bunch of you know, old Italian guys sitting around slapping each other on the back saying, you make a <laughs> I'm going to put this seal on your prosciutto. Or your cheese is fantastic. It's not self-serving. It is a, an independent European association. Um, Italy just happens to have more DOP and IGP products than any other country. So they both refer to the fact that the products have a long history, that they're traditional in their origins, but also traditional in the way that they're produced that they come from a very specific region, that they're packaged and produced in this specific region. The only difference really is that IGP, uh, for, that, for that designation, one of the steps can be done outside of the region. So that means uh, with, say, SPEC, for example, the SPEC that we're using tonight, um, IGP, that means that the feed for the pigs could come from a different region of Italy. The pigs still have to come from Italy. They still have to be you know, raised on certified farms. They still have to be cured in a specific region. But one of the steps, like the feeding or the packaging even, if that's done in a different province, then it's not eligible for DOP. DOP means everything happens from the first grain of wheat that is planted uh, to the final shrink wrapping and labeling has to be done in a certified area. So the DOP is a little bit more stringent but they are both, you know, just guarantees of quality. That's perfect. And if, uh, I don't know if everyone can see here. I'm just going to quickly show you these are the two seals. This is what you should be looking for, correct? The red seal is the uh, DOP and the blue is the IGP. So uh, you want to look for these labels on your products to ensure their authenticity, correct? Correct. And like I said, because it's a European designation, not all DOP and IGP products come from Italy. There's DOP products and IGP products from other countries. But it gets quite confusing when you're buying, I don't know, olive oil, for example. My head spins when I go into a grocery store and I see all mm. the balls of olive oil with Italian flags and product of Italy, made in Italy, 100% Italian, authentic Italian. Like there's so much confusing labeling. Um, that I just look for the label. I just look for the DOP or IGP label. And that way, I don't have to worry about all the other little misleading sort of, uh, you know, colorful bursts of red, white, and uh, green on a, on a label. It's crazy. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I think uh, we should get started and, uh, and get away with these amazing products. So as you mentioned, uh, we're going to be using Spec and uh, Montasio this evening. Yes. So, yeah, two products. We're going to ease into this. This is our first class of the year. So we're going to ease into it and try not to do anything too intimidating. So we're going to make a fantastic panino with some spec, uh, IGP from Alto Adige, and some DOP Montasio is going to be in the panino. But then we're also going to use both products for a little salad to kind of go on the side. Now, Spec is, I don't know, it's, it's, this, it's this meat that is magical. And people, honestly, like, I love it. It's one of my favorite cured meats. But for some reason, people don't know about it. People know, you know, prosciutto and salumi and coppa and pancetta. But spec is always like this, this sort of mystery. And spec is wonderful. Spec is basically the process is very similar to how prosciutto is made. But a couple of differences. One, in the curing stage, uh, there's a lot more flavor added to the meat when it's curing. So it's not just salt, uh, but there's juniper berries and rosemary and bay leaf. Some people use cumin, some people use coriander. Then each house uses different, uh, a different recipe. But it's the, same, it's the same kind of meat. It's a leg of a pig. It's just deboned into individual little muscles. 
And then it's cured with the salt and the spices, and then it's air dried. Um, it develops quite, an, quite a big mold on it. When you see this after it's finished aging, there's a good quarter of an inch of mold on the outside, um, but that gets washed off before it gets shipped. Uh, and it's, it's just a beautiful flavor. The other thing that separates it from other cured meats is that it's one of the few that are actually smoked. So the smoking process is very different than how we smoke uh, here in North America. Generally here in North America, we brine our meat, we put it in a smoker for six hours, we take it out, it's done. With the spec, the smoking process is much colder and for a much longer time. So the, the, after the pieces of meat are cured, when they go into the smoker, uh, it's usually beech wood that is used because beech wood, ha beech wood has a very low uh, amount of resins in actual wood. So it doesn't, it doesn't burn the meat. It doesn't like, you don't get that, that burnt sort of flavor. Uh, but then it's smoked for a little while, then it's removed to air dry again, and then back into the smoker and removed to air dry, and back and forth in and out of the smoker. Very time consuming, but the process, the product is just a very softly, mild, smoky flavor, as opposed to eating, you know, a piece of bacon that has been, uh, you know, turbo smoked for three hours. <laughs> It's true. It's a very delicate flavor. Spec, uh, I'm with you on this one. I absolutely love it and uh, I wish more people would discover it because it's it's quite phenomenal. Well, that's why we're here today, right, Jenny? We're here to like introduce people to, to Spec. Yeah, we go. That's it. So let's let's show, show us how to use it, Roberto. Okay, so very, very simple. When you get Spec, um, it has the skin on. So uh, it, all this top layer needs to be removed. Now, if you're buying it at, you know, a deli, hopefully they will know to remove it, but pay attention because it's been known to happen that uh, the skin isn't removed at the deli counter. And then what happens is you get your spec home, you go to eat it and you get all these little crispy pieces in it. Not very cool. So the skin needs to be removed with as little of the fat taken off as possible. And this is, this is one of those fights that we have in North America is that people want to have their, want to have their, their meats with all the fat removed from it. And that's not cool. The fat is where the flavor is. The fat yeah. has more contact with the air and the spices than the meat on the inside. So it actually has much, much, much more flavor. So you want to leave all this nice, beautiful fat on it. And when you're slicing spec, there's two ways in which to slice it. One, traditionally, I mean, you can cut it on a meat slicer, which we're going to use for our panino. But the second way that we're going to cut it is for our salad, where you're actually cutting little chunks of it. So there's like a nice little mm. bite of smoky, delicious meat. Uh, so to do that, I mean, it's very simple. You just cut nice, long, straight, try and be straight. That was not so straight. <laughs> I'm cutting sideways. It's a little odd. <laughs> my, my chef professors from school would be yelling at me if they saw me. And once it's got, yes, yeah, nice and dry, you can see here how nice and dry it is. When you cut it, it kind of like shreds a little bit. That's beautiful. It's not, it should be like moist, but not, not soft. Like when you push it, it shouldn't like just get squishy and gross. So once we cut a nice little slab, we're just going to cut little strips and we're going to add that to the salad fat and all again, we're going to leave all the fat on there and we're just going to cut these beautiful, delicious little strips. Now I always cut this way across the profile of the spec because the top side has the fat, as you can see by the my glistening fingers, uh, and the bottom side is nice and dry. So you get this beautiful cross section of everything, the fat from the tip all the way down to the dried up little bit on the bottom. And that way you get to experience everything that spec has to offer. Cool. So, so the other thing, say... like I said, is sliced. So I pre-sliced it because I didn't want to bring my flywheel slicer in here. I don't want to get a hernia. So uh, I pre-sliced, but same thing um, as when you're, when you're, you know, slicing most cured meats, you want it to be thin. So you can see 
when I pick up a slice here, it is thick. Like you can read right through it. So thank you, Jen K. Overwheel. You can <laughs> read right through the slice of the spec. Now, because it is fairly you know, dry uh, when it's done well, it has a tendency to be a bit tough when you're going to eat it. Especially in a panino, you don't want it to be too, too thick or else you're going to get your panino, you're going to go to eat it and like uh, wrestling to get it. It's not very, not very gentlemanly or ladylike. Or ladylike, I would say either. We want to be civilized. Let's say civilized. Yeah. So thinner slices and many more layers of that thin slice and you'll get a beautiful little panino. Wonderful. So to assemble the panino, I mean, the idea is quite simple. Oh yeah, look at the cheese. Um, the idea of the panino is very simple in that we want to keep it, we want to keep it simple. Traditionally, you know, if you're in Italy and you stop to get a panino, it's not like going to Subway, you know, you don't get 19 toppings on your, on your meat and your cheese. It's meat, it's cheese, it's bread. Maybe a little spread, maybe a little vegetable, but it's, it's very clean and very simple. And that's what I'm doing with this panino here today. So we're using the spec, which is, again, fantastic. Oh yeah, Panino di Venezia Giulia uh, and Veneto is the region where they're made. So high elevations in the mountains, uh, along with the Montasio as well. So the Montasio, this is honestly my favorite cheese in the world. Uh, I, people say I'm crazy. There's so many better cheeses out there, but honestly, Montasio is by far my favorite cheese. Um, this was my after school snack. Uh, since I can remember, I would come home and my mom would have a bunch of sliced Montasio and a pear. And if you ever have the opportunity, get a piece of Montasio, get a piece of Bosque pear. They have to be Bosque. I don't know why okay. the Bosque pears work better. But like a very hard boss pear, mm -hmm. like, you know, when they're nice and crunchy, put the pear in the fridge so it's cold mm -hmm. and take it out, slice it, eat it with the Montasio. I didn't realize it when I was a kid, but it is the perfect example of a food pairing of flavors that work together. And I have since ripped it off so many times in my kitchens, made salads, <laughs> made it. This is why we use, uh, this is why I'm calling it the Panino di Montagna, because the speck is from a mountain region, the Montasio is from a mountain region as well. Uh, Monte Montagno, it's a mountain in the north, uh, and the cheese has been made there since the 1200s. Uh, it's a wonderful cheese that comes in four different ages. And this is the youngest of the, the ages that we get here. So this is about, it's about four to five months of aging. And it is my favorite because it's the softest, it's the sweetest, it melts well. Um, as they age, they get harder um, to the point that you can grate it. So the oldest that you can buy is a Stravecchio, which is 18 months or mm -hmm. older. And when you get to that one, it's, it's almost brown on the inside. It's very dry. But the beauty of Montasio is that I've had wheels that I've aged up to five years. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, had, I was very fortunate. I had a restaurant that uh, we had this giant room that we uncovered during some renovations. And it was, it was about 20 feet high, completely underground. I think it was an old cistern, stone walls. So I turned it into an aging room. Oh, and I had I had Montasios in there for for five years, and when I cut into them at five years, it was magical. It was magical. I love the young one, but cheese at five years old, yeah. There's not a lot mm -hmm. that can handle that. Not a lot of cheeses can handle that, but the Montasio did exceptionally well. So and this, is, this one's a cow's milk cheese, correct? Uh, Roberto. Yeah. So this is cooked cow's milk. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's pasteurized. And ooh, it is um, very lightly treated. Like there's not a lot of rennet. There's not a lot of, like I said, aging with this one. So it's very clean in its flavor. And that's what I love about it is that it tastes like milk. Like it tastes like cream. You can mm -hmm. actually taste the cream. Now we have to be careful here because there is, there are a couple of, 
producers here in Ontario that are making um, cheese and calling it Montasio. Now it's Montasio style, but it's not Montasio. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you know, it's kind of very wrong to be doing that, but you'll see it in the grocery store. And I do it all the time when I go to a grocery store, I always check uh, to see what's happening in, uh, you know, in the deli section. And on more than one occasion, I have seen the Ontario Montasio labeled as product of Italy. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the managers are usually quite quick to, you know, say, oh, it's just a mistake. And I go back an hour later to make sure that the labels have actually been changed. Uh, but it is quite confusing uh, when you see Montasio, Montasio. And then if you don't take a good look at it, you're buying the Ontario stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, horrible. it's not a horrible cheese, but it's not the real Montasio. So the real Montasio just has a little bit more, well, no, a lot more flavor. It's <laughs> wonderful, wonderful cheese. I'm trying to be politically correct. Well, we're talking about we're talking about cows that feed in the Alps of Italy, so you know. <laughs> it's it's a little bit different. The process is different. The cows, the actual breeds are different. The mm -hmm. feed is different. The rennet is different. So yeah, I mean the Montaggio style just means cow's milk cheese that is fresh. But you can you know without regulation, you can say that about ninety percent of the cheeses that are on the market. So this is what the young Montaggio looks like when you cut into it. Very white, very small little bubbles of, of air. As the cheese gets older, these little bubbles sort of, uh, you, they start to decom not decompose, but you can't see them as much. And you mm -hmm. get these big flaky chunks of, of cheese, which is again, incredibly delicious, but more for grating than for slicing like we're going to do here. So, uh, so Beth, I have a uh, I have a question uh, from uh, from one of our viewers here. They're asking about the availability of the Montasio, and it's it's fairly readily available in uh, in you know most uh, most delis, Italian delis, and like boutique grocery stores. Correct? It's fairly easy. It's everywhere in the in the delis, and sometimes I'll strike up a conversation with the deli manager, and say, "Well, how much Montasio do you guys go through?" And they're like, "Man." It's here. I don't remember. It's been here for a couple months. Uh, in the Italian delis, yeah, it moves a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, you can find it in all the major grocery stores. It's it's very readily available. But again, if you don't know it, it's kind of might be intimidating to try. It's so true. It's you know what? Very approachable mm -hmm. cheese. It's not like it's not like trying to convince somebody to eat gorgonzola. It's it's Montasio. It's ah, it's wonderful. So the real way to know. Sorry, I forgot to show that part. Ooh, to know that it's Montasio, check the rinds. So the Montasio, the name is is uh, embossed on the cheese exactly how you see it here, on an angle, alternating up and down. On the you know bootleg Montasios, they'll just write, they'll just have Montasio written across it in one way, um, or the name of the manufacturer written on it. But in order to have that that actual Montasio on an angle, alternating. That means that, yeah, it's the real stuff. But keep an eye out. The rind tells you everything. So I'm just going to cut off the rind. So unfortunately, the rind's not edible. Um, so we're just going to slice this off. And I'm going to cut some nice thin slices for our panino. Now, the reason I want to cut it thin is because I kind of want it to melt. Not completely. It's not going to be like fior di latte on a pizza. Uh, it's going to, you know, still have some of its of its body to it after the panino is done. But you want it fairly thin so that it will kind of melt and get gooey. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So you know how hard it is not to eat these right now. <laughs> like I feel like a dog in front of a, a food bowl. <laughs> Okay, so before I assemble, are there any questions that I need to answer, or can I? So I have that. I have another question that has come in. You uh, you talked about cutting off the rind. Uh, could you similarly do what you do with that rind that you do with Parmigiano rinds, like hang on to it for flavoring stocks, soups, sauces? Yeah, you absolutely can. The top side, the paper doesn't come off very well, like the actual 
montazio thing it's really hard to get it off in one piece like it just sort of it shreds usually so that top side is a little bit harder to use but yeah generally i'll keep them and then when i'm making like a, a real sugo like a meat bolognese kind of sauce <laughs> then i'll just throw the rinds in there and then my son and i fight over who's going to eat them <laughs> okay so we're going to assemble our sandwich so we take our sandwich our panino and we cut it the length one. Now, this is where you sort of have to make a judgment call. Sometimes the bread is very thick. So when you go to do your, your filling, you'll end up with more bread than actual filling. So what I generally do is I'll cut out a little bit of the inside of just the, the meat here. I'll do the sideways. Just the meat of the bread. So it's not so bread heavy. Um, I don't know. For me, it's just a, an ease of eating. It's just a little bit easier to eat it when there's not so much bread. Um, and I want to get the ratio right. If you have a nice thin bun, then you can get away with it uh, without cutting out the center. But generally, I'll just cut a little bit of the center out. Now, this is where it gets tricky. This is the hard part. Okay? Everybody pay attention. We take our speck and we put it on top. Oh, wait, sorry. Put our cheese down first. See? I almost blew it. So we put our cheese down, nice and, you know, full covering the size of the bun. Try not to have too much sticking out. If it's overlapping, if it's sticking out from the edge of the bun, during the cooking process, it's just going to drip off, hit the pan, burn. Um, then you got to pick it off to eat it because you're not going to waste it. No, so of course not. Off and burn your fingers to eat it, and it's no fun. So you want to keep a little bit, you know, a little bit in from the edge of the bun. Then we put our speck on. So don't lay it nice and flat. It's okay. Just a nice big mountain of, of speck. Now, use a lot because we're going to press the panina. So when you go to put it on, you're going to say, holy moly, that's a lot of, that's a lot of speck. And this does look like a lot because it's sliced super, super thin. Mm -hmm. but really, weight-wise, it's not that much. So you can see how much meat there is. It's a good mountain of meat. Now, I am going to add a little bit of greenery to this. I'm going to add just a few leaves of arugula. Lovely. Just a couple. Um, this is equally for aesthetics as it is for flavor. This just gives it a little counterpoint, a little bit of bitterness, um, a little pop of pepper uh, to, to sort of complement the the spag, the smokiness of the spag and the richness and sweetness of the montage. So now we do a little drizzle of olive oil, like just a tiny bit. All we're doing here is we are just moistening the arugula. We don't need oil on the spec, it's got enough fat, just a little bit on the arugula. We do our second layer of cheese, and then we put our top back on. So on its own, that's a pretty decent sandwich. Uh, yeah, I would say it looks good right there. You could, you absolutely could. But a panino, is, it's just not the same without, without the, the toasting, without the grill marks. I don't know, it's something that I really enjoy. And not everyone has a you know a panino grill in their house mm -hmm. so i'm going to show you guys how to do it at home super easy so i'm going to move over to the cutting or sorry to the to the pan where we're going to cook uh where we're going to actually cook the panino so let me just turn this on any okay. questions and, uh, yes i was just going to say while your pan is heating up there we had another question come in um saying about eating the prosciutto is important because the balance of of the meat. Is there less fat because speck is less salty or does it have to do with the smokiness? Sorry, I didn't hear that last part. Is it less? Sorry. It says, is there less fat because the speck is less salty or does it have to do with the smokiness? Um, the fat? Uh, no, I mean, it's just trimmed a little. It's trimmed a lot, la a lot more. So there's less fat to begin with than when you're actually, you know, talking about prosciutto or other, or other pieces of meat. So the, the meat itself starts out a lot a lot leaner before the mm -hmm. whole process begins. 
And then uh, I had another question. Someone is asking, would the flavor of this panino be compromised by um, adding a balsamic? Sorry, compromised by what? If, if uh, you add a reduced balsamic drizzle, would it compromise the flavor of the sandwich at all? You could. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Uh, but the, what I love about this panino is that it's clean and it's just a, a few flavors. So the more you put on there, the more you sort of mask uh, the, the flavor of the speck and the flavor of the montasio. So it wouldn't kill it, mm -hmm. um, but it would just, yeah. I mean, especially because it's an acid, it, mm -hmm. uh, it might cover up the smokiness for sure, which is sort of the special, special element of the, uh, of the, of the panino, of the spec. That's right. what makes it special. And do you have a uh, do you have a preferred type of bread you like to use when you make your panini? No, no, no. I'm for me. I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I don't. When I'm making panini like this, I stay away from whole wheat. I stay away from nuts and berries and olives <laughs> and all that stuff because again, you want to focus on the filling. I want to focus on the spec. I want to focus on the montasio. So you know, crusty bread works well. A focaccia works really well. Uh, as long as it's fairly neutral in flavor, that's all you really need. Sounds okay. good. So over on our pan, our pan is getting warm. So what I have here is just a grill pan. So this is just a cast iron grill pan, pretty simple lodge. Uh, I'm using an induction burner over here, but you can put it right on top of your regular, your regular stove, a gas stove, electric stove, it doesn't really matter at all and you want it to be fairly warm. Now, to sort of replicate what happens in a panino grill, we put our panino down on an angle and we press it. So to press it, I'm just grabbing another cast iron pan. So this is just another cast iron pan, a little bit smaller in diameter, and I'm just going to put it on top. You gotta balance it, it takes a little bit sometimes, and then, the weight of the cast iron pan will actually do the pressing of the panino. So you just let it cook like that. Now you want to do it at a sort of a lower temperature because you want the heat to penetrate through the bread and actually get that cheese a little bit melty. If you do it over too high of a heat, you'll get beautiful hash marks like the little grill marks. Mm -hmm. But then everything on the inside is going to be, you know, meh. <laughs> it's okay it's still beautiful cheese but a little bit warm a little bit soft is kind of what we're looking for that's the the aim there so if someone doesn't have a cast iron skillet what else would you and like would you just use a regular skillet and maybe put a brick on top to give it that weight or yeah i mean you can use like there's different kinds there's this is a cast iron grill pan it just has the little grill marks on it but i mean every company that's when they're um, you can make enamel ones that have the little grill marks on it. There's electric ones, uh, little electric griddles that have the little grill marks on it, or you can do it on your barbecue. Now, if you do it on your barbecue, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot harder because you want to get your grills hot. So turn your grill on high, let the bars of your barbecue get nice and hot mm -hmm. and then turn the heat off. So then when you put your panino on top of it, you're not getting that dry, hot air coming up from your burners. Because what that'll do is it'll toast the bread in between, in between the bars. Um, and it'll like burn your bread more than anything. So you turn the heat off where your panino is, but you leave the burners beside it on. So wherever your panino is, no flame underneath, but flames off to the side. So there is still some heat being generated in your barbecue. And then you just follow the same process. You put it down, let it get some nice pretty marks, you rotate it, flip it over, and Bob's your uncle. Very it cool. Okay. to do it this way. Um, a panino grill, it does both sides at once, and you're done. Uh, <laughs> but cooking should never be a race. You know, like we should enjoy it. All these TV shows where it's, oh, I'm going to do 17 courses in uh, 45 minutes. How we should cook. We should just enjoy our time in the kitchen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have another question for you. Someone is asking about the greens you put in the sandwich. If you don't have baby arugula, what would you 
suggest as a substitution? Well, I mean, it's something that's a little bit better. Radicchio works really well. Um, Treviso Radicchio works really well with this dish. Um, endives work well if they're a little bit green because they t t tend to be a little bit bitter. Uh, but any green really does because it brings out it brings out like a grassy earthiness uh, and it adds it to the to the dish. If you don't have arugula or rocket and you have to use, I don't know, spinach or something, make sure you give it a few good turns of pepper because it's that, that pepperiness of the arugula is what really makes the dish work. It really adds, like I said, a counterpoint to all the other flavors. So it makes the sweetness of the speck and the cheese seem even more sweet. Sounds wonderful. And uh, in terms of, in terms of we're talking about authentic Italian products and preserving, uh, preserving their authenticity, do you find that uh, like creativity sometimes gets challenged in trying to preserve the authenticity of the products or it's, it's quite easy to be creative with the, with, you know, these simple, beautiful products? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, it's hard because it's a hard country to tackle uh, when it comes to authenticity because every town, uh, I mean, where I'm from in the north, we make these little ravioli that we call yum bang, which is our dialect, which is just horrible sounding, but they're delicious. If you go down the valley about 10 kilometers, they make the same ravioli, but they have a completely different name for it. On the other side of the mountain, in the towns over there, they have a ravioli that's called Yande, but it's got a completely different film. <laughs> and then if you go down a little bit more to the mouth where it goes into the Po River, there's a little town there that, you know, has Yande, but they're a different shape. So authenticity is it's a very hard thing to, to prove. And everybody has their own version of it. But that's kind of the beauty. I think of, the, of Italian food is that you never stop finding cool, authentic, original uh, dishes. And that's why as an Italian chef, I mean, you could change your menu every week and be in business for a hundred years and never get through half of the authentic dishes in Italy. So wow. that it's the same with the product. I mean, there's, there's authentic products everywhere in Italy and we in North America, unfortunately, we don't we don't have access to a lot of it. Um, but that's why we all got to get on a plane and just <laughs> as soon as it's feasible to do so, right, Chef? Absolutely. <laughs> no, I mean because that's the only way you're going to do it. And I've been I mean I've been traveling to Italy my entire life, and I've been a chef for 25 years. So when I go to Italy, I, I go and look for things. I look for ingredients. I look for dishes. I look for restaurants. And I never, ever, ever run out of things to see. I never run out of new experiences. It's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Speaking of uh, speaking of sort of experiences in restaurants, we do have another question. Someone is asking if you have ever visited the Prosciuttificio Golf Sauris in Friuli. No. No. Apparently, no, their stuff is incredible. <laughs> With my, my role as the Canadian brand ambassador of uh, prosciutto di Parma, I do do a lot of research on all the prosciuttos that are in Italy, but unfortunately I can't get to everything that I want to get to. Um, so yeah, no, I have it, but it's on the, it's on the list. <laughs> there you go, list. add that one to your list. This uh, Chris says that the spec is incredible there, so. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, let's go, Jenny, I'll meet you at the airport. Okay, sounds good. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to start our salad so that we don't get too far behind. Um, so I call this an insalata seria. So it's a serious salad. That's kind of what I'm calling it, a serious salad. And I call it a serious salad because this is what my, um, what my cooks used to make for me in the restaurant. Uh, I would be working, you know, crazy hours, and my cooks would come to me and say, hey, chef, have you eaten today? Have you eaten today? And I'd be like, I haven't eaten three days. I don't know what you're talking about. So uh, they would make me this, this salad. And it's usually, you know, a salad with a simple green as a base, and then a whole bunch of stuff on top of it. So this, this panino itself 
it's, it's, you know, it's bread, it's cheese, it's meat. So it's not the most completely nutritious uh, meal. <laughs> so to try and make us feel good about eating four ounces of, uh, of beautiful cured meat and an ounce and a half of cheese, uh, we're gonna put a little salad with it, but we're gonna make it substantial so that this is a complete meal. And honestly, this is one of my go-to things for lunch. When I, you know, don't have a lot of time, and what I do for the salad is I just open the doors of the fridge and then I just see what I have. Honestly, that's how it works. I go in, I look at what I have. So, you know, we have some artichokes. So I just grab a couple of artichokes. Uh, we have some chickpeas to you know, give us a little bit of protein, make it, you know, healthy. <laughs> um, olives because a salad, a salad without olives, I don't want to. Okay, uh, very, and it's actually very fitting because apparently today's National Olive Day. So there you go. What? Did you know that when you were creating you know the salad? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't checked out your Instagram post today. So <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a little bit of tomatoes. So just a little bit of grape tomatoes that I've cut up. Uh, we have some toasted pistachios. Again, just mm -hmm. because a little bit of crunch on this on any salad is is essential and a little bit of roasted pepper so i actually roasted the peppers they weren't kicking around in the kitchen but in the fridge but i actually roasted them and then last thing i just found a couple spears of asparagus so i just cut them up and we're going to use a couple spears of asparagus so i'm going to flip my panino oh, yeah. oh wow look at that so we're got some beautiful some nice on hash marks way down the second side and this is why it's important to do a lot of meat because it does get uh, co compressed quite a bit so this is the hard part because that top side is kind of round so it's going to want <laughs> to pop it around a bit so you got to do a little jenga action to get it to stay so when you're heating up the panino like that chef does uh, does it enhance the smokiness of the speck uh not not a ton i mean the warmth does more than anything when you warm up uh, the spec, uh, you do notice a lot more smoke flavor. So when it's raw, it's very lightly smoked. When you warm it up, the smoke does become more pronounced. The flavor of the smoke does become more pronounced. But that's just a temperature thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the panino is paninoing. So I'm going <laughs> to move my camera back over to the cutting board so that we can watch the assembly of the salad and the whole plate kind of come together. Now, yeah. it's taken me a while to do this, but if I wasn't blabbing, I would have been, <laughs> been done a long time ago. Well, but it's like you said earlier, right? It's the experience of being in the kitchen. It's supposed to be enjoyable. So having a conversation, putting together the food, enjoying it. Experimenting too, right? Like a big part of, of what I like to tell people is that the recipe should always be considered guidelines guidelines that even if you take a traditional traditional recipe you always follow the recipe the first time because you know you don't want to upset the culinary spirits oh <laughs> fun to play with it you know like if you if a recipe calls for rosemary and you absolutely hate rosemary don't put rosemary in it or put like a little bit of rosemary in it and play and experiment and try and that's how recipes develop as a chef, that, that's how our recipes come to us. It's not, you know, it's not like I wake up in the, as a chef, I wake up in the morning and I have, you know, dreams about my next menu. That's not, that's not how it works. You, you try, you experiment. Sometimes they go well, sometimes not so well. I have a list of some pretty horrible ideas I had over the years. Um, but it's the fun of it. I mean, and as a chef, that's one of the joys that, that we get is experimenting and actually creating new dishes. Now, you know, everything's been done before, really. Like, if you dig deep enough on the internet, you're gonna find you're gonna find every recipe that you've ever tried in your life. <laughs> um, but it's still kind of fun to believe that it was yours, and it's fun to to actually come across something when you when you have that eureka moment and everything works out the way you wanted it to that's a it's a it's a magical feeling it really is yeah.
that's the best way to describe it. It's so true. It's pure magic when the ingredients just work well together and, and the flavors. And it's, it's always hard. Like I've always said as a chef, the hardest part for me um, was always doing the tasting. Like whenever I had a new menu and cooking one of everything and then letting my servers and my cooks and the manager and the dining room manager and the owner taste everything. That was always the hardest part for me as a chef because it was like I was putting a little piece of me or many, many, many little pieces of me out on a plate to mm -hmm. be charged. Wow. And it was, it was hard. It really, really was hard. But when you got it right and everybody's eating and going, oh man, that's amazing, chef. Because <laughs> um, they know not to say anything else. Um, but when you get that feedback, it's just an incredible, incredible feeling. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That that anxiety that I felt for so many years, I wouldn't trade it for the world because it's just, oh, it's just an amazing, amazing feeling. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna put our salad together. So again, I'm gonna start with a little bit of the arugula or rocket, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is going to be tossed in at the end of our salad. Because what I like to do is I like to get all of my other ingredients into the salad and dressed right away so that they have time to absorb all the flavors of the dressing. So our chickpeas, our tomatoes go in, our olives, and because it's National Olive Day, a few extra olives. <laughs> and I noticed you're using an assortment of olives there. Is that just because or, or does it... Uh... Is it because it's what you had in your fridge? <laughs> because they're good. So our speck goes in and our pistachios are the last thing. So an important part when you're plating a salad, honestly, is to always think about your presentation. And you don't think about your presentation when you're putting it on the plate. By then it's too late. Mm -hmm. So you think about it beforehand. And what I always do is I always reserve a little bit of all of the ingredients. So I have a little bit of my speck, my artichoke, uh, my pistachios, a few pieces of my asparagus left over. And we're going to use that at the end to actually do the final plating of the dish. So once our ingredients go in, we start with our dressing. So with this dressing, I love the flavor of red wine in my, in my dressings that are very vegetable heavy. But red wine on its own is, it can be a little bit too acrid, like a little too acidic mm -hmm. um, and a little too strong in flavor. So I'm using a little bit of red wine and red wine vinegar, sorry, and a little bit of lemon juice. So both of them, lemon juice on its own, the citrus is too strong, mm -hmm. um, but the citrus of the citrus notes of the lemon juice and the red wine vinegar together make a wonderful, wonderful combination. So they balance so each other. Right? Goes in first, always when you're dressing your vegetables or you're dressing your greens, always make sure that your acid goes on first. If you put your oil on first, it coats all the vegetables so that when your acid goes on top of it, whatever acid it is, it hits the oil, it runs off into the bottom of the bowl, and all your acid is just hanging out at the bottom of the bowl. Oh, I did so not know acid that. Acid first, and then oil on top. So just a really good quality olive oil. I'll spare everybody the rant about good olive oils. Just look for <laughs> the DOP. Don't be scared about the price. They last a long time. They're well worth every penny that you spend on it. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that, Chef, because it's true. I mean, you know what? You not get a decent bottle or, or I don't even think it's a real bottle of olive oil if it's costing you five dollars no no you can't and you know people are kind of gun shy and they're like oh you know, thirty dollars for a bottle of olive oil oh my goodness oh my goodness it's so much but I mean go to the LCBO what, what kind of wine are you going to buy for for thirty dollars you can buy some diesel wine for thirty dollars mm -hmm. you pull the cork and you drink it with one dinner it's gone and it was wonderful spend thirty dollars on a bottle of olive oil You'll have it for, I mean, I go through a ton, but most people, a bottle of olive oil lasts a month. Yeah. So it makes countless dinners better as opposed to just one dinner with a nice bottle of wine. So, yeah, bite the bullet, just do it. <laughs> Recommended by right. Dr.
So our ingredients are together. Our bonino is done. Woo, that's hot. And we're just going to plate. Beautiful. So, you see that in my salad mixture, I don't have any of the lettuce in here now. Because I'm tossing it, because I want to make sure that it all gets coated very well, if I put the arugula in now, it's just going to get bruised and beat up mm -hmm. as I'm tossing it. So I start out making sure that everything is nicely coated uh, before, before I put the arugula in. Now, this on its own is a pretty decent salad. You can just slap this on a plate and everyone would be happy. But we're just going to add a little bit of greens. But again, not a ton of greens. We want it to be very, very veg, very, very olive and chickpea and pistachio heavy. The greens are a component and not the main component. So we toss all this in. Our speck is in there already, which is going to give it the saltiness that we need. Uh, I'm not adding any salt or pepper to this because the rocket is, sorry, the arugula is very peppery. Mm -hmm. The speck is very salty. So you don't need to add any salt or pepper. If you love salt and pepper, for sure. Add a bit more. In there, but you really, really, really don't need to. So to plate our salad, or sorry, our whole dish, we start off with the panino because it takes the most space on the, on the dish. So we're going to start by cutting it on an angle so that we get inside and when you cut a panino here let me do this one use a serrated knife two don't rush it light pressure see i'm going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth i feel like a lumberjack you know <laughs> start with of wood. that's how it should be if you take your knife and you just sort of force it through you're just going to squish it you're just going to like you can make the panino angry so oh back and forth that's why that's why knives bread knives are long you make them long so that you can use the whole length of the knife going back and forth so once it's done we have see how the, the meat has been yes. compressed quite a bit but mm. I, don't know how, I gotta get a better close up there you go yeah, yeah you can see the cheese has started to melt a bit yeah yeah and the cheese if i try and pry it open the cheese is going to be all melty oh that's hot mm. <laughs> so, i'm not going to do that so we go to plate, we put our panino down, and what I like to do is make sure that one piece is kind of standing up. Just helps with the aesthetics, builds a little bit of height into the dish. So just like that. And now our salad, you know, we can just kind of put it however, wherever we want. So I'm just going to sprinkle it nicely around the outside, leaving a little bit of negative space. And yes, use your hands. The best, Hopefully. the best tools, right, Chef? It is. I mean, tongs, you can't plate salad. Well, you can. You can't plate salads well with tongs. Mm -hmm. um, tongs will break up your leaves of lettuce. Uh, they're clumsy. They're awkward. Just use your hands. You're good for family <laughs> and friends. It's fun. And then the last ingredient. So this is where I always, like I said, I always reserve a little bit of everything. So I have a couple pieces of asparagus that uh, when I look at my salad, I don't see any asparagus. So I'm just going to take a little piece and put it up here in a prominent spot. Another one over there. I look at it. You know what? There's a spot where we need a little bit of dark. So I'm going to put a little black olive on there. Put a couple of the chickpeas on. Make sure chickpeas. that we have the pistachios nice and you know prominent. You want to look at the salad and be able to see what's on them. That is beautiful. So our last step is the montazio. Oh, can't so forget what that. I'm going to do, what I'm going to do for the montazio is I'm going to cut it a, a different way. So instead of slicing it, when you're doing a salad, again, you know, it's delicate, right? You want it to be easy to eat. You don't want to be chewing your, your cheese and having it nasty. So I just take a vegetable peeler, regular plain old vegetable peeler, and you just peel it with a vegetable peeler, and you get these nice, long, beautiful little shards of, of cheese. And they look great, and because they're nice and thin, they dissolve when it hits your tongue. It just sort of melts, especially the young Montazio. Mm -hmm. It will just sort of dissolve, and you'll get the beautiful flavor of the Montazio. 
and it's easy to chew and eat. And Wonderful. That's it. And so you just okay, so we have this salad. beautiful sandwich and salad. What would you pair with it? Beer, wine? What would you recommend, Chef? Oh, I mean, this on a patio with a nice, you know, sparkling, a nice, I don't know, a nice Prosecco, <laughs> even uh, oh. the sparkling bread from my region, I have a, a little bit of a soft spot for, so a nice Lambrusco. But Lambrusco, I, I, mean, I love Lambrusco. <laughs> the thing is, I mean, good food and good drink, yeah, it's kind of hard to go wrong. Really, it's kind of hard. So... That is, I'll just do the little close-up shot of <laughs> how your sandwich and salad look. Beautiful. Nice color your sandwich, a nice little, you know, crescent of your salad. And like I said, these ingredients that I put on are just, they're just a suggestion. You don't have to use these ingredients. If you don't have roasted peppers, don't use roasted peppers. Um, just throw stuff onto your salads that you get this, this you know, insalata seria because it has proteins, it has uh, all kinds of different flavors that are complementary, and you end up with a pretty, pretty tasty little lunch, I think. I love it. It looks fabulous. It looks seriously delicious, chef. <laughs> And easy, right? Like that's, that's and that's the best part, especially for a meal. Like perfect. That is absolutely a great meal to just take out and sit on the patio, like you said. Gonna be a, a, <laughs> come on all the time. Okay, I'll bring the number as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Chef. That looks incredible, and we cannot wait to see what you'll be cooking up next week. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, Chef and Jenny. Uh, thank you, everybody, for following this class uh, this evening. I hope you enjoyed and everybody enjoyed this Tutia Tower experience as much as I did. In the next few days, and I wanted to remind, remind everybody about this, you, one of you, one of the, 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 the audience, some, somebody from the audience will be notified as the lucky winner of a gift basket compliment of Jen K. Overwill. So thank you so much, Jen K. Overwill, for sponsoring this class. We will let you know directly whether you uh, won uh, their gift basket. And thank you, Chef uh, Roberto Fracchioni, for this very informative and fun class. Jenny Arena for joining us uh, tonight. And we look forward to having you back next week. And of course, thank you so very much to Astrid, Ilaria, Monica, Mary, and Richard, and all my colleagues uh, at Eco Canada uh, for uh, making this possible. So, arrivederci e grazie mille.